Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And you know, it, it's the uh, end of summer. Mm-hmm. And my annual, just because it's colder, virus, whatever, Kicked is in. now yeah. creeping into my life. I mean, it's well past end of summer. It's mid-October, although it's awfully nice on the coast this past week. Yeah. I've been yeah. I've sequestered myself away working on the history of .NET. Yep. Well, I, I resisted fall as long as I possibly could, you yeah. know, wore my shorts for the last week. <laughs> Just, you know. And you got a cold. How did that happen? I How did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you are not going to believe how awesome my better know framework is today. I'm, you're just not going to believe it. Well, then awesome me. All right. Roll the music. All right, dude. What do you got? It's an app. Okay. It gets rid of spam calls. It's really? called RoboKiller. Okay. And it's awesome. <laughs> all right. Now, it would be okay if all it did was just... You, you don't have any spam calls. Right. But there's an option called answer bots. All right. Okay. Do you remember hip hurts from right. Mondays? <laughs> yes, yes. All right. Richard knows. Many of our listeners probably don't. Yeah. But basically, it's uh, something that engages the caller and, you know, it, and answers the phone and says, like, hello? 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 I'm sorry. I can't. And then goes on and leads them on down this long conversation and they're actually recordings there it's not a bot like with a speech synthesizer right they're actual recordings of people just stringing your spammers along that's what hip hurts was yeah and then it records them and then you can listen to them <laughs> and then it's entertaining i mean the interesting point about that is it hits the telemarketer exactly where it hurts which is tying up the telemarketer as long as possible Exactly. Hang-ups are cheap, right? They just call the next yeah. one. But if you can, if they're holding them on the call for five, ten minutes, then, you know, th then the yield goes way down. And suddenly it's like, this is not a constructive strategy to sell stuff. So, so I'm linking, because this is 1592, I'm linking yeah. in the show notes uh, in 1592.pwop.me to a, a YouTube recording, and it's audio only, okay. of an amazing an amazing string along with a answer bot. Oh my goodness. And the guy is like, okay, I got to go now. And then, <laughs> you know, she moves on and, uh, oh, it's just hilarious. <sighs> you got to think with a, with all of the new machine learning AI stuff, you could make a bot that's profoundly talented at keeping somebody on the phone forever. That's right. I mean, I instead of just playing a recording, yeah. you could just have these random things that answer in the right place and, you know, yeah. Interrupt. Not even that random. Actually, being intelligent about you know talking as long as possible without actually making a sale. Yeah. Right. Never ever getting to yes. All right. I've got a winter project now. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> 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 yeah, because you needed another hobby in your life, brother. That's I what know, you yeah. needed. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I got. Uh, who's talking to us today? I grabbed a comment off show fifteen sixteen, the one we did with Mister Connery. Uh, back in the day, this is from February of 2018, we talked yeah. about his book, A Curious Moon, which is actually a tutorial on learning Postgres. And we're talking Postgres today, so I thought it was appropriate. Right. And that, of course, actually Tom Betts, who's, you know, one of our regular listeners for forever and comments mm -hmm. on a routine basis, sort of said, you should have tagged this with geek out, which is not far from the truth. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I think I ended up f being inspired enough from that to later make a geek out on life on other planets. But I'm going to read this comment from Topper Kane, who said, This was awesome. I love how a discussion of Postgres ends in the discussion of the meaning of life. It's a brief aside, and at the end I found it really interesting, the idea that discovery of life on another celestial body would be a relative non-event, which was certainly how Rob took it in his, in his mm. book. I propose that we will feel like that at first, but the idea of becoming an accepted fact will have a slow and profound change in the way we relate to the universe, which I completely mm. agree with. It, you know, we won't react right away, but this, no, there are, uh, there is a other life elsewhere, and it's just not that rare, is pretty powerful. We will have basically eliminated the possibility that we are entirely alone in the galaxy, and that idea will eventually permeate culture. I don't know how it will affect culture, but it seems unlikely that it will truly be a non-issue. Yeah. Not exactly a database conversation. You know, a lot of philosophy. This is, you know, philosophy rocks. Is that where we are? Okay. I guess so. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. 
that was a great conversation though. I remember it. Yeah. Well, and uh, you know, it was a little bit loaded dice because Rob had used me as an editor and actually we fundamentally, I think you saw this, we fundamentally disagreed on the ending of his book. Yeah, that's right. And I was animated enough about it that at one point Rob literally sort of grabbed me and said, are we still going to be friends if I disagree (laughs) with you here? And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm going to get over it. You're still wrong, (laughs) but I'm going to get over it. (laughs) You know, I'm going to have to feed him my book now, although my ending's not going to be near as interesting because it's the truth. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Topper, uh, also a longtime listener. We really appreciate your support of the show and excited to send you a copy of Music to Code By. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code By, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and we don't publish to Google Plus anymore because gone away. Yeah. So we publish every show, show to Facebook. And if you write a comment there or on the .net Rocks website and we read it on the show, We'll send you a copy of Music to Code By. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. And send us a tweet. You might even get an obscene reply from our botnet. <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> there you go. There's a bot for you. We have a. We could have a disgust bot that just responds to every message. <laughs> That's not what your mother said last night. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, how, do, how do these things happen on there's this a mo- show? There's a Monday's bit in here. There is. There's a Monday's right. bit in here. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, uh, let me introduce Craig Kirsteins, and he's our guest today. He heads up a product at Citus Data, which turns Postgres into a distributed, horizontally scalable database. He curates Postgres Weekly a weekly newsletter for all things Postgres. And prior to Citus, he was at Heroku for several years, where he ran Heroku Postgres. And uh, today we're talking about Postgres on Azure. And uh, welcome, Craig. Thanks. Great to be here. Great to have you. Uh, did you read Rob Connery's book? Let's just get that out of the way. I did. I was. Uh, I had thought about writing a Postgres book for a while myself. And then he went and did that. And I feel like I, can't, I cannot top it because it's entertaining as well. So, um, so, yeah, basically now just, you know, given up and deferred to him. Yeah. So Postgres on Azure, I think, was uh, released back in June or July, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, around that time. Um, definitely super excited to see, you know, Microsoft and Azure getting into the Postgres game. I think, you know, for me, I, I worked on .NET things whew, 10, 10 plus years ago um, and then moved over to, to other languages for a while. Um, these days, engineers don't let me ship anything to production. So um, yeah, I know that feeling well, actually. <laughs> it's uh, it's usually my, my threat to the engineers is, you know, um, when is this going to ship? And they say, when I get around to it. And they say, don't worry, I'll do it. And they say, you know, no. don't worry, it'll be done by tomorrow. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> Good strategy. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it was a world I never thought I'd see of, you know, Microsoft running, you know, an open source database when they have SQL Server. But uh, times are changing. It's great to see them supporting it and, and be out there. So isn't Postgres typically embraced by the the open source community? I mean, it's an open source thing, but do you find that there's an actual market for running Postgres in Azure? Yeah, I think so. I think it's early days, but it's absolutely growing. I think if you look at Postgres, it's probably the one of the most unique open source projects around and one of the most unique databases around. Hmm. Should we do a little of the history? Because I've heard bits of this on and off for years. Like, where did Postgres come from? Why does this thing exist? So it came, the name actually means post ingress. Ingress was one of the first relational databases out of UC Berkeley. That's Michael Stonebrecher. Exactly, exactly. He uh, he won this, you know, little Turing Award thing the, for the, it. The little Turing Award, yes. <laughs> Get your little trophy. <laughs> Put yeah, it up on your little counter. It's a thing that some people are, are excited by. He was yeah. also fundamentally against the language SQL too. Like he didn't like when in the early days of databases, when there was there was sort of this movement towards consolidating into a single query language. Here was this you know Turing Award winner, incredibly important guy in databases, and he thought that having one query language was stupid. That that was not the way to go, and he, you know, lost that battle. I don't know that he was necessarily wrong, but he he lost that battle. Everybody else consolidated on on SQL uh, for better or worse, and uh, and he went a different way. 
Yeah, so the original Postgres was not SQL, right? Um, and then actually they added SQL support, which was a, a big move. Um, and then you got the name, which uh, still confuses people today. And one of my favorite uh, emails from the Postgres mailing list is uh, from Tom Lane. Tom Lane is one of the committers of Postgres, a major contributor. Um, he he worked on uh, TIFF, uh, the JPEG spec. I think co-authored libjpeg, co-authored the PNG spec. Wow. Uh, wrote you know libpng. And then said, okay, I'm done with images. Let me go, you know, do something else. And he's been working on Postgres for the last 10, 15 years. Wow. But uh, Mm. there's a great email from him. Uh, I think it's about 10 years old now saying the biggest mistake we ever made was the naming of Postgres QL. Because people call it, you know, Postgres SQL, whatever, when they tacked on the the SQL name. Um, So for ease, it's just, you know, Postgres. You can't go wrong with that. Right. Was there ever an issue with the size of uh, a Postgres database, like a four terabyte limit or something? Um, Postgres keeps getting better and better in terms of scale. Um, it depends on, you know, what's the ideal for what size. Um, part of actually what we do at Citus is, you know, help you scale beyond a single node. Um, I've heard of 10 terabytes on a single node before. Wow. Um, for our Citus customers, we have a customer in production at 890 terabytes, so not quite a full petabyte, but, you know, close enough. Staring it in the face, um, yeah. That's across about 70, 80 nodes. So, the the thing that's available on an Azure is Postgres SQL, right? Yep, yep. So, it's the standard generic open source Postgres. Okay. And why would somebody, other than the fact that they, you know, they know it and they use it, but why would somebody choose that over, you know, Azure SQL? Yeah, so for me, Postgres has you know a lot of different features. I think if you look at it, it's been around for, for over 20 years. So it's, it's kind of a old, stodgy, just works database, doesn't lose your data. Um, in the last 5, 10 years, it's really become much more sexy. Can I say sexy about a database? Sure. Um, where you know they started with, okay, here's Geospatial, which it's one of the richest geospatial databases out there. Yeah. Unless you want to go fork over a lot of money to Oracle. Um, and even in toe to toe, if you're doing, you know, geospatial stuff, whether that's, you know, on the earth or on Mars, um, <laughs> it, it's really rich there. Right. And there's not another competitor for it. Um, mm-hmm. it's added things like full text search. That's really rich within the database. Um, it was one of the first ones to add JSON support. So you can have relational and non-relational right there side by side. Mm-hmm. And it just keeps laying around, layering on things. So to me, it's, um, because of the community around it, it's moving so fast that it's just going to get better and better. And it has features that other databases don't. I remember one of the first things I ever wrote into the RD alias in like 2004 was a comment about Postgres. And in, 2000, uh, in 2004, it was very much this open source project when open source was nowhere near as hip as it is today. And the comment I made, it was, this is a database that because it is open source, I am able to pass a table as a parameter to a user-defined function, but I can't do incremental backup. Hmm. Because passing a pr- table as a parameter in a user-defined function is a really cool thing to build that an, you know a volunteer, an open source contributor would build. But incremental backup is hard to get perfect, and mm-hmm. folks didn't want to build it. Is it still just truly an open source project, is there, or is there more of a company behind it these days? Yeah, so it's definitely truly open source. There is no one, based on the license, no company can ever own Postgres. Okay. Not possible. Right. Um, which puts it in a very unique territory. Now, I think it has changed a little over time where there's a bigger community around it. People are working on those hard problems. There are people that are funded full time just to work on, on Postgres via, you know, various consultancies or product companies. Um, so I think you'll see. Some of those things that 10 years ago, 15 years ago were hard and not fun to work on. Right. Didn't get attention. They're getting much more attention now because of how it's ri- risen in notoriety. Speaking to disaster recovery, there's uh, the the standard um, Azure backup and restore stuff that happens automatically behind the scenes with this. And uh, I don't know how um, similar it is to what happens in Azure SQL. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, from the user experience side, I know it's very similar. Under the covers, I'm not sure how identical it is. 
Um, my suspicion is more similar than not, but I'm not sure under the covers. Hmm. But it's very cool to just be able to say, uh, you know, I want to go back to, you know, this day or that day. But I, I don't know what granularity they, they back them up with. Yeah, Postgres actually used to have time travel directly built in hmm. and decided it was too much to, uh, to maintain and no one ever used it. So they ripped it out. And now I think it's come full circle because uh, I've had customers that on a Friday at 4 p.m. say, hey, I, I accidentally dropped a table. Um, and my first question to them is, are you kidding? It's like, <laughs> no, I ran my, uh, regression, uh, suite against production. Uh, so everything's gone. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> I'm like, all right, here we go. Um, a few minutes later, they're back up and running. Cause you know, we had that built in, but, mm. uh, yeah, that was, uh, I, I cracked open a beer right away of, all right, <laughs> here yeah. we go. Yeah. All right, here we go. <laughs> There's no reason for me to do this sober. I am obviously not coming home for dinner. <laughs> Settle in. Uh, it's interesting, again, to look at this as an open source project that is not like, I mean, Microsoft's .NET Core is very much an open source project, but there's a Microsoft employees that make the vast majority of the contributions to it. You're telling me there's no single entity that does the bulk of contributions to Postgres? Like it's just literally that distributed as a, as a product? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, and it's fascinating with how long it's been around and the pace it moves at that it, it works that way. It's you look at some of their uh, practices and so much is still done on a mailing list. Like there's not a Slack, there's not a you know. It predates GitHub for that matter, right? Like it's it's an old school source uh, open source project where it is its own repository. And like patches get mailed into the mailing list like they they email the patches in it's like forget this pull <laughs> request nonsense who, who would do a pull request who does that that's too fancy and new why would we do that when we have a perfectly good transport right here <laughs> email <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness wow. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's, in some ways it's very futuristic or, you know, it's almost like it has that first mover problem that because it came from these, this earlier world, they just haven't adopt, had to, had to adopt a lot of the things we sort of expect from open source today. There's a, is there a good migration story? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on, on where you're coming from. Like, uh, for the app side of things, um, most ORMs will just work, right? Like it's, Fortunately, we did standardize on this thing called SQL, and there's slightly, you know, uh, different variations of it. But most apps just work. And then if you, you know, start doing custom things, uh, it becomes a little more advanced. If you have a lot of, you know, procedural SQL, eh, it's a little different there. Yeah. Um, but yeah. if you got a basic app, usually you can drop in. Migrating the data is a little more work. Um, there is a tool, uh, PG Loader, that will go and help dump convert uh, data formats over to from anything into Postgres, um, which is a handy tool. Um, so the answer, it, it kind of depends. Like sometimes it's drop in, sometimes it's less so. Okay, you can also use the Azure database migration service, I think. Yeah, I do believe it supports, you know, um, into Postgres, which yeah. is a, a great tool when you've already got it running on Azure and need to up and, and lift and shift. Yeah. Yeah, if you're already living there, and we, I mean, why would someone, you know, if you, why would someone move over to Postgres if you're living in 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 SQL Azure already? You're already, you're going to still pay. You're paying for the cycles of the of storage, but uh, so it's not it can't necessarily be a price thing. What's the real distinction there? Um, so I see a lot less people up and move an existing one and build net new ones. Right. That's generally what I see. Is um, uh, and it's. I want more open source in my org, right? I can open source is cool again and I can hire easier for it. Um, if, you know, I'm working on closed source thing versus open source, you're going to just find more people that want to work on open source. Yeah, interesting. But then it comes back to the features, right? If you're doing geospatial stuff, if you want full text search, um, the extension framework in Postgres is really interesting. Um, it has this framework where people can, outside of the core of Postgres, basically add in functionality like new data types, new indexes um, without having to contribute to core Postgres. And I think it's unique in that sense. Um, to me, the extensions foundation and people being able to add and contribute to Postgres without having to become a committer is really going to be the, the future in the long term of it. And so I think it's a 
net new project and you want some of the functionality in Postgres or you want to move more towards open source. Absolutely. And Craig, let me interrupt you for just a moment for this very important message. Hi, this is Richard. The Dev Intersection Fall Show this year will be December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Hotel. The lineup is awesome. Scott Guthrie, Scott Hanselman, Scott Hunter, yes, all the Scots. But also a ton of great industry speakers for some insight on what's coming up in the world of .NET. You know, Core 3 is bringing client technology like WinForms and WPF into play. Could it be time to migrate your existing desktop apps to this new technology? Come learn more at Dev Intersection, December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand. Go to devintersection.com to register and use the code .NET Rocks to get a discount. And we're back. It's Richard Campbell and Carl Franklin. It's .NET Rocks. And we're talking to Craig Kirsteins about Postgres. All flavors, really, because there's a bunch of them. But obviously, the I, I've done a show on the run as side about Postgres on Azure and also MySQL on Azure, which is also weird when you think about that. But we did do a show a while back, and I believe it was Jeremy Miller, uh, about Martin on Postgres, which was this uh, extension, I think very .NET centric uh, for um, using Postgres as a, as a document database. I don't know if you're familiar with Martin at all, Craig. Uh, vaguely, I've not used it personally, but uh, somewhat familiar with it. Yeah, okay. Well, it's just you know, it's it, you talk about that extensibility model. This is one of those examples, I guess, of these are are tools that you can add on libraries. You can add on to a data store to make it easier to do the tricks you want to do. Yeah, and the JSON support to me is you know really exciting and impressive. I think some people are still surprised of hey, Postgres is a document database, but it's the same binary format you've got in something like Mongo, right? But you can index every column, every you know, uh, or every key, every value directly in it with like a simple gen index. So um, mm. there's a this group of uh, developers within the Postgres community known as the Russians, and uh, they <laughs> are they Russian? <laughs> they indeed are. Um, <laughs> and one of them is actually a professor of astrophysics at the University of Moscow, and. Wow on Postgres for fun, as you do. And they show up with like a, hey, here's a new crazy research on this new index, um, like a gen index, uh, which is generalized inverted index. Most people like hear about it and like, eh, this is crazy. It's a narrow use case or um, does it make sense or not possible? They kind of go quiet. They show up three months later with like a full like patch on the mailing list, of course, of here it is. It's implemented and it usually gets committed. But uh, it's it's funny because we have, you know, standard B tree indexes, which is what most databases have. Sure. have but we also have GIN and GIS and SPGIS um, and Brin indexes. Um, the Russians recently said, hey, we have uh, GIN. So the next index type we need to add is vodka, of course. Um, <laughs> there are I rules here. Don't, I don't think they're kidding. I think vodka is coming to Postgres. But um but yeah, the the extensibility of hey, we got JSON. Now we have index types for it. Makes it you know really powerful and a great thing to use. And you still have all the you know safety for your data constraints, all of that. It's just such an interesting community. And p poking around about sort of Russian Postgres, you run into Postgres Pro, which I, I guess is just a yep. branch. Like what, what are they doing there? I don't know how familiar you are. They with believe they're a consultancy, so they okay. they do a lot of work over there. Um, but they employ a bunch of those uh, people that end up uh, doing a lot of that work. Um, I, I think they're growing pretty well over there. So it's you know, I think Postgres has probably become you know the database uh, for Russia um, to store all of the records. What are the cases to run on prem versus running in the cloud for this? Uh, you want to feel a lot of uh, pain and torture. Um, so I. Uh, <laughs> you hate yourself deep down and you want to torment yourself. Is that it? Feel the pain. <laughs> I, I've been running uh, Postgres for people for eight and a half years now. Um, uh -huh. Heroku was one of the first Postgres as a service providers. Right. Um, we, we had all these Ruby on Rails developers asking for a, a Postgres database. And we thought, how hard can this be? How hard could it be? Um, that's famous yeah, it turns last out, words. Don't do it. Um, so uh, we launched on AWS first. Um, I've been running it, you know, Postgres now on, on multiple different services, AWS, Google, uh, GCP over, over time. And uh, yeah, running a database, it's kind of a, a thankless job. Um, yeah. You don't get 
credit for doing it well, but you hear about it when you do it wrong. Sure. Like security. I've, I've used that line many <laughs> times. You can always get a, you can get a C when everything is perfect and you can get an F when nothing is perfect, but you can never get an A. There's just no way. Exactly. Exactly. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm a cloud guy through and through, right? Like when you've got Azure that's taking care of backups, monitoring, high availability, um, you don't have to worry, right? Like, right. crap, I did accidentally drop my my entire database. I can roll back to this point in time right before that happened. That type of security, you don't you don't want to be responsible for that. You don't want to have to, you know, hire a DBA because you're not going to be able to hire the best into the industry mm. because it's working on running one of these services, right? So I think, you know, you can run it yourself if you've got various regulations or, or reasons for that. But I just find more and more people are, hey, trust this to someone that can hire all the experts and you get all that value. Yeah, right. Well, and, and also it's that whole 24-hour staffing, like there's always somebody monitoring. They pick up the security vulnerabilities before anybody else does. Like, It is very hard. And again, I'm wearing my IT hat. We have this conversation all the time on, on run as for exactly that reason. It's like there is a certain size of organization where you could complete with public cloud, but you're probably not that size. Like you don't have a knock, you don't have 24 hour coverage, right. you know, full shifted people. You don't have an infosec specialist who's constantly keeping up to date on all of those issues. Like it, it's just not, you can't compare the two. Yeah. And I think even at that size, like I, I, I look at it and you can't hire the best people in the world because they want to go and work at these places where, you know, uh, at Heroku, we ran 1.5 million databases for right. customers. Uh, um, I one in a million problem was literally once a day. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think wow. that's a really interesting angle on it. When you talk about the kinds of people that will do this work and, and are great at it mm. and what they actually want. I remember I was having a conversation with Scott Stanfield at Vertigo about, it. he had all these rock star type developers that wanted marquee projects. And it's cool because you get to work on marquee projects, but it's also terrifying because you have to keep providing marquee projects. Mm. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the nature of, Postgres, what it is, it's the the challenging, really hard ones. And you don't get access to those super challenging things when you're running five databases right. or 10. It's at the millions and millions of scale that millions and a half. you didn't think this could happen. And it's it, it's a different set of interesting, but still those marquee projects are the interesting, hard problems. Interesting and terrifying. Yeah. Depends on personalities. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah, it's time to open a discussion about how the Edmonton Oilers handled their databases in the post-Gretzky era. Wow. I did that one for you. <laughs> That's some serious hockey puns you pulled off there, my friend. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a great one. <laughs> oh, jeez. Say stop. Hey. <laughs> Help me <laughs> make the bad man stop. I think the comment was funnier than the joke, actually. <laughs> It's <laughs> usually the case. <laughs> it's actually, truth be told, time to give away a $200 Amazon gift card, compliments of Progress Telerik, to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, let me tell you about the most comprehensive developer toolkit for building modern apps on the market today, Telerik DevCraft. With more than 1,100 Telerik.NET and Kendo UI JavaScript components in controls, you can easily build modern, high-performant web, mobile, and desktop apps, as well as chatbots. Ooh, chatbots. Ooh. Yeah. The tool set also, hey, that's what I can use for my project, the Telerik chatbot tool. There you go. All right. Well, the tool set also includes reporting solutions, automated testing, and productivity tools, and comes with a range of support options. And new this year is a free online training program for all license holders. With this, alongside thousands of demos with source code, comprehensive documentation, and a full assortment of Visual Studio templates, you'll be up and running with the Progress Telerik and Kendo UI tools in no time. Download a free 30-day trial today at Telerik.com slash download. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Kenneth Nilsson. Congratulations, Kenneth. Golf clap for you. Nice. Very nice. Well done. Kenneth just won a $200 Amazon gift card from Progress Telerik just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to be a member of the fan club, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the club. 
We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club. But you got to sign up if you want to win. And we also ask our guests, Craig, if you had $5,000 today to spend on technology, what would you be buying? So I just got a new MacBook, so I don't need that. Well, there goes five um, grand. Boom. <laughs> 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 well, I say that out loud. That's not right. <laughs> I, I may have already spent it recently. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> I would, uh, for giggles, I would actually probably consider donating uh, directly kind of to open source. Um, Interesting. Like, I think open source is often a, a thankless uh, act, especially working on some of these hard problems. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, 2004 and hey, Postgres didn't have, you know, incremental backups. Sure. Hmm. It's not fun to work on. I would probably go and say, hey, Guys, go work on this thing that isn't fun, is thankless, and, and you know, improve it for the rest of the developers out there. Because um, I already have my new MacBook, so I'm set. <laughs> do do cool. you see much in the way of that sort of bounty mentality where you can basically people put cash against a feature they really want? Do, does, does that seem to work? There's not really that today. I think it's been explored and experimented with. Sure. Um, there, there are a number of consultancies out there that you can basically go to one of the consultancies... Um, there's Crunchy Data, Second Quadrant, uh, PG Experts, um, and you can go to them and basically say, hey, I want to fund this. Here's some money. Go do it. Right. Um, there is a uh, PostgreSQL US nonprofit organization that helps support various meetups, uh, conferences, that sort of thing. So there is an official foundation in the US and Europe uh, on the nonprofit side, but okay. it doesn't fund the core development. Right. And that, and that's, there's an interesting dance here about money and open source, I think, in general, right? We, the, one of the upsides to having these big companies basically putting employees on th things is that you don't see the money, even though the money is there. I think the, the bounties were always vaguely repugnant, that it was basically a competition for money, that I'm, I'm coding for money. But th these developers deserve to make a living, too. They, they should be able to eat. Yeah, I think it's a tough balance. Like, I've, I've seen both sides of it where... You know, I can give you money, but I kind of care a little bit about what it's going for. Yeah. Um, I expect results from it. Yep. I, I don't want you, you know, adding in, you know, a data compression type for flowers because that doesn't seem useful to the rest of us. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, hey, uh, we've had some great things come out of it and, you know, developers want to work on what they want to work on. So yeah. there's a, a balance there. I think good companies, uh, big companies hiring people to work full time on open source is a great effort and um, have seen Microsoft doing a lot of that, which is really exciting. Well, they, you know, the way they describe it these days is simply that's how they work, that they've always working the work they've always worked. It's just now it happens to be via GitHub so in an open source way. But largely the, their work hasn't changed that much. They include the public more. We hired some of those back at Heroku, and I think there was that, but there's also you get insight to the customer problems, right? Yeah. Those one in a million problems, like you don't know about those unless you're you're there. So I think it's it's even better. They would they would say, yeah, I'm working the exact same way I've always worked, but I think the insights they have to problems are different. So it kind of sears their work a little bit. Yeah. Well, and also that that by nature visible. So that if you want to know, you can know. I've all, I've often equated, you know, that the the .NET repository is like, it's a mall. If you want to overhear somebody's conversation, you can. It's just there's so many, so much conversation going on all the time and most of it relatively innocuous. You just don't bother listening. But I do like the fact that they've simply done it in the open. And I often wonder if they, that awareness that they're in the open kind of polishes their behavior a bit. Like you're a little more polite and a little more circumspect about things, which I think ultimately serves a purpose that we're, we, all, we could all stand to be kinder. I thought everyone was nice and polite and open source. Well, especially um, Linus. Like there's the nicest yeah. guy. <laughs> Holy man. He's the model. Well, of he's, niceness. he is, he had uh, that, that recent letter and he's going off. I mean, literally for therapy, you know, that's really interesting that, Anger management. Yeah. Analyze this. Right? Well, he's ready. He, it's now a problem. I think he even he's not even acknowledged now. It's finally, a, he, he, I think we always made an exception for him for whatever reason. Right. And finally, it's no longer acceptable and he's, he's dealing with it. Hey, Craig, how does uh, Postgres in Azure play with .NET? 
Yeah, so there's uh, a number of different ORMs out there. Um, basically, uh, I would say look uh, look at the ORMs and pick your flavor, right? Like we mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, Martine, um, which is more on the JSON B side. So when I think ORM, I think LLBL Gen, uh, I think N Hibernate, and I think Entity Framework. Um, and there's a NG PG SQL, uh, which is specifically a .NET Postgres one. NGPG oh, okay. SQL. Okay. Um, actually, it looks like that's within the entity framework. So um, you're just specifying specifically within the entity framework. Use this one. Okay. So the, like that is, is that the preferred way to do things then? Is MPG SQL? I've seen... I, I don't know that there is a preferred yet. Okay. Um, I think it's still early days for, for .NET and Postgres. So I think um, they're moving at a different pace. Probably NGPG SQL. But... Mm-hmm. Um, as soon as I say that, it's going to change. There's going to be something uh, new and hot otherwise in, you know, six months. So just to be clear, NGP SQL has an entity framework provider. Okay. Right? And that's what you use to call uh, into Postgres. Yep. Yep. Okay. But it's interesting to think in terms of you go through an ORM. That's just what you do. You don't make calls directly to Postgres. Exactly. I mean, it's the same way for, you know... Um, SQL Server generally when you're building an app these days, yeah, right? You're yeah. going through your ORM. Yeah. Now, if you're going to the, the reporting side, you know, that's a different story, right? Sure. Um, a big thing I, I hear from people coming from SQL Server is, where's my GUI? Which mm. uh, Postgres is much more of a command line. There's a number of GUI tools out there. Yep. I'm a command line guy. Um, PSQL is my editor. Um, but I, I tweak it out just like... I do my my bash shell. So I set up actually a psql rc file so I can have like timing automatically on in my terminal. I can do, you know, backslash e um, and it opens up my default editor, which can be Adam sublime text vi to edit the query and I just save it and run it. Right. Um, There's uh, basically a lot of nice extra commands because I live primarily in a, a CLI. So that's my preference, but there are a number of GUI ones out there. And I'd say, do some look. There's not a recommended one by the project, which I think stumps people. But if you search around for like Postgres GUI editor, you'll find a lot of options and um, each has something different. And I'm, you mm-hmm. know, looking at the Visual Studio Marketplace for VS Code. And there is both uh, a, a PG SQL extension and a Postgres SQL management tool too, Postgres SQL. So... The, the definitely is Perfect. tooling. There you go. Yeah. And and the idea of using VS Code as your editor, totally doable. You're going to get highlighting, like you're going to get all those good things. Yeah. Nice. It's just interesting to think through, again, because if you default to SQL Server all the time, there's a bunch of tools you use by reflex. You don't even think about it. And now that you're switching databases, you need a few tools. You need a, a management tool. You need a querying tool, a place where you craft and tinker with queries. And then you, you hopefully have some integration in your existing dev environment. Yeah, there's uh, it'll be different, but the some equivalent will always exist. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So yeah, all the pieces are there. You just have to put them together. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about horizontal scaling if you've got some time for it, because I I mean it's one of those bizarro land stuff. Back back before the public cloud was really big, we had a lot more conversations about horizontal scaling. These days, it seems like the cloud is the answer to all things. Just turn up the knob. Yeah, it's the easiest thing to do, especially for your database. Like for the app server, right? We can put a load balancer and run a bunch of different app servers. Yep. For your database, well, that's that's harder, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, the easiest thing you can do is is throw throw more memory at it. Right. Um, the correct amount of memory for a database is more. Exactly. <laughs> always. Things are slow. Just get a bigger one. Yeah. Um, but at some point, even on the cloud, there is no bigger instance you yes. can get. Yeah, you will. You eventually do hit a wall. Yeah, and it's well proven, right? You look at Salesforce, you look at Google, you look at YouTube, Facebook, every single one of them, they're not running on a single database instance, they're running on thousands. Like sharding is the answer. Yeah. Um, at, and it scales pretty infinitely. Um, five years ago, 10 years ago, it was a hard problem. I think we've enough people have done it now that we know how and it's more predictable, um, but it's still not necessarily fun. So um, I think there's a lot of good videos out there. Um, for Citus, what we do is basically hook into those low-level extension APIs to your application. It still looks like a single-node database. Right. 
uh, under the covers, it's sharded and split up across multiple physical nodes. So application still sees one. We rewrite queries on the fly, send them down to the right node, get the results back, and bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, you do something like a count star across your entire database, we just split it up and do MapReduce. So um, basically, we're under the covers running, you know, distributed SQL, which there's a good bit of research on. So, it, I mean, we're, we're presuming folks understand all of these things, so we may want to break more of this out. When you shard, you're really talking about different reading points, primarily distributing the data, as opposed to writing points? Nope, actually just writing, so okay. uh, as well. So if you think about having like a uh, events table, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm going to shard that, I'm going to split that up and say events underscore one, events underscore two, events underscore three. And, you know, I'm going to start with, say, two nodes, right? Right. I'm going to have maybe 32 events table, and I'm going to take half of them, put them on one, half on the other. And what I'm going to do is data comes in, I'm going to have my, like, ID of that event, right? My primary key of it. I'm going to take a hash value of that, and I'm going to split up the resulting hash range. So maybe, like, event ID number one, I don't know, is hash value 123. Mm-hmm. And my buckets are like 0 to 32, 32 to 64, et cetera. So it's going to end up in like events underscore four table. Right. All that makes sense so far? Yep. And basically, then when I go to get that data, I'm going to say, uh, give me, you know, events for ID one. I'm going to look up that hash value, see where that, you know, mapping table exists, reroute it to this other events underscore four table and query and store it there. So. That's the high level principle of sharding. Um, now, you know, just do that and you can scale infinitely. Um, the reality is, you know, implementing that now, now you've got to go and build application logic. How do you have these mapping tables? How do you hash things? That sort of stuff. That's where the, the legwork still comes in. You've got this overhead to your rights trying to get them out to the right locations uh, versus the correct number of shards, right? If you have an infinite number of shards, it's going to be too slow. You need the right number of shards. Like, it's, it's, it's actually really interesting math. Yeah, so, you know, um, there, there's a, a million is usually too high in terms of shards, right? Um, <laughs> Generally speaking. Two is too low. Uh, yeah. Somewhere in between, right? Yes. I often see, like, 128 is nice because um, the bit nice thing about your shards, right, you're going to have start with more shards than you do nodes. So if even if you have two nodes, you might have 64 shards on each. Right. And then as you add nodes, you can just move, hey, half the shards from here over to those new nodes. Um, so you don't have to go in and invasively break up tables, that sort of thing. Now, what about geo distribution in a scenario like this? Yeah, so there's a couple of things there, right? If you're doing it for uh, like disaster recovery and such, um, you can just replicate either synchronously or asynchronously to another region. Mm -hmm. If you're saying, hey, I want to write to, you know, an east region and, and also write to a west, you're solving a very different problem. Right. Um, that's kind of a multi-master setup. Very, very different use case. More commonly, I see the, hey, I if east goes down and falls off into an ocean, I want to fail over to west. I see that more commonly. And there you can use just standard kind of replication tools. Right. Yeah, but actually figuring out when you're trying to pursue lower latency by localization, this is much more of a CDN type problem. And it's it's different. It's a different problem. Yeah, exactly. Like stateful rights to guarantee that they're there, you know, aren't going to magically be fast and perfect and no. uh, localized. Like Well, you ha and you just have to deal with the exception cases. Sometimes it will be slow. You can't guarantee perfection all the time. Like that's, it's not that easy, but that's getting, that's way off in the weeds of this problem space. The, uh, the and I'm presuming when you talk about all the uh, shards and nodes, it's all virtualized. Like this idea that we do bare metal databases, this is an obsolete concept. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the cloud's only growing. It's only getting better. You can move faster with it. It's yeah. You're, you're not rolling this on your own unless yeah. you're Google or Facebook, right? Yeah. But I, I like that, that Facebook exists for us to, un I think Facebook gives, to, from an IT perspective, it's like, look, sharding is real, it's normal. But hmm. Facebook also taught the average mortal about update latency, right? You, you make your post to Facebook and you don't, and then you immediately refresh your page to see your post and you don't see it. So you post again and then you see two. It's like, look, wait, in a sharded universe, updates take a little while. Just wait.
doesn't work so well when I, I try to do that for a bank statement. Yeah, see, they're just being high maintenance that way. But, <laughs> but it's you know the other thing is that generally when you're working with an internal app like that, there is a reconciliation period, and so the, you know there is a deadline to when things are have to be a- accurate, so forth. But you still you have to deal with a certain amount of latency. Anyway, still in the weeds. So, Craig, tell us a little bit about Postgres Weekly. Uh, you're do- managing a newsletter about Postgres. Yeah, so, you know, I've been in the community for a while. Um, I curate Postgres Weekly, which is a weekly newsletter that drops really targeted at app devs. There was a lot of stuff out there for the, you know, uh, DBA types. Right. And as a app dev, I'm like, okay, Postgres is awesome. It has all these cool things. Why aren't people talking about this more? So it's uh, a curated, you know, usually 5 to 15 kind of, hey, here's the interesting things that someone wrote about or did this week with Postgres. Um, nice, easy to skim over, hopefully. Um, so if, you know, any of this has uh, caught listeners' attentions on, you know, why Postgres is great, they want to learn a little more, hopefully it's a, a great resource to check out. For sure, yeah. No, it's cool. A lot of, it's a lot of work to do that, to, to actually curate all that stuff. It's so interesting. Well, uh, Craig, what's next for you? What's, what's in your inbox? Uh, probably more meetings, but uh, no, it's uh, back to back to work at Citus today and uh, got customers to and features to build to uh, help scale Postgres when you outgrow that single node and have to shard and don't want to you don't want to deal with all the complexity mm. um, got to go help more people do that so um, and try to have those one in a million problems so I can keep hiring the interesting engineers <laughs> <laughs> awesome <laughs> well thanks very much for uh, spending this time with us it's been very enlightening yeah thanks so much great chatting All right, and we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a toy boy. Life is hard.